Allora diamo modo a tutti di poter... So, let's give everybody a chance to get seated. Let's resume our proceedings and we'll try and I obviously ask for my... Uh, for these cooperation of speakers to make up for this 10 minutes delay. Our goal is to really make, give everybody the opportunity to listen to the next presentation. So, so I'd ask you to end by 10 to 1, which is the time we have available for our panel. That's our goal, the deadline. Yes, exactly. Uh, but I know that I have some very experienced panelists, more experienced than me and myself. So we'll be working as follows. So we'll start with Mario Kuzmai, who is a researcher at the National Institute for Public Policy Analysis. And we'll be playing. Um, so we'll be talking about play sensitive and he will explain what this means and what it consists of and why should it be of interest to us and to highly sensitive people and uh, as recall this morning those are in a position along the spectrum so it doesn't concern the population at large and then we'll move on to explore the future well no or oh, who knows well yes Roberta Terzi who has a long-standing experience in corporate management both public and private she's a coach and she is a strategic foresight specialist she deals with strategic forecasts uh, futurist uh, uh, in Italian, though it doesn't work so well in Italian because it refers also to other aspects. So enjoy the journey and uh, I'd like you to speak one after the other without me interrupting you and then after that we'll share some thoughts together. Yes, thank you. Can I stand up, Maria? Yes, of course. No. Again, I'd like to thank Maria again for the invitation. Sorry for, uh, for you because I'm turning my back to you and sorry to you because you're seeing my face now. At the institute I work as a research group, we are carrying out a qualitative survey on innovative training methods for lifelong learning. So Maria was referring to a journey and we're traveling through this vintage camera metaphorically with an initial focus on research activity and an overview of architecture which involves in-depth biographical interviews to HR and uh, development and training uh, experts, interviews with consultants and uh, learning experts. And this research activity also involves uh, some focus groups with the three uh, categories involved uh, mentioned previously and some case studies such as chaos pilot. So piloting cases at Danish business school which draws inspiration from the Berlin Bauhaus School and, it, and has a very significant experiential uh, model for the development of uh, yeah, um, entrepreneurial leadership and experience of his uh, an ex escape room experience uh, which can help develop 
uh, gain skills in uh, creative problem solving and uh, regarding the overturning uh, of uh, perspectives, flipped learning. Maria yesterday asked you to put a thumb in front of you. So changing perspective as an image you see, this refers to a performance of the artists of the Cirque du Soleil, artists who through passion and play have put it together a significant and amusing uh, work. So play is uh, understandable when it's part of the previously mentioned uh, case studies, chaos pilot and escape room. Let's take a step back now. Once upon a time, as every fairy tale begins, in uh, 2021, the uh, Journal of Italian Trainers, FOR, hosted us on a, a monography on technology enhanced learning. And one of the articles developed with uh, Martina Cresci, my colleague, was on games and plays, uh, playing and emotions. So let's try and share a possible interpretation of what we mean by playing in this context. This uh, nice, lively old man who is climbing up a rope is Stuart Brown, an American psychiatrist and founder of the National Institute of Play, one of the most uh, experienced person regarding play, and he provides a possible definition, a mental state when you have, when you are entirely absorbed in an activity that produces amusement and a sense of time being suspended. So a sense of suspension of time. Karina, our colleague, referred at the beginning of a contribution to Ik and Nunc, to the here and now. The Chins in Mia Island, the psychologist talks about flows. Our need for play doesn't end, it changes as we grow up and in adult age too. We don't stop playing because we grow old, but we grow old because we stop playing. This image refers to a movie with tag. It's a real a story about friends who play tag every year and they invent stratagems, funny ones to play together. At the end of the movie, after a touching ending, after the final credits, we see the real videos of the game play of these friends who played this game for 30 years. Now, in the case of highly sensitive people, uh, not only as suggested Maria, play is essential because it helps reduce overstimulation and to root uh, emotions. So I'd like to offer some uh, suggestions to develop playfulness, uh, more conscious playfulness. The first thing is to learn from the animal kingdom, and we'll see why. We can claim that we have been programmed to play because play helps develop social skills and significant ones too. So play as um, a technology, a social technology. We see this with dolphins, with bumblebees, a part of the bees. A special, a spe an article in a specialized journal, Animal Behavior, is entitled, Do Bumblebees Play? And the answer is yes. And then the octopus, a docu-movie of 2021. My octopus teacher that won an Academy Award in that specific category talks about the empathetic uh, relationship between Greg Foster, the director and maker of the movie, and an octopus. And in a very significant scene, the octopus 
breaks free because he sees a, um, a, a school of fish uh, swimming by, but not to attack them, but to play with them. And then talking about uh, spending time, I'd like to show you a short video that can help us further think about this. Jack Russell. A Jack Russell playing with his ball in a redundant uh, man. In a retro way, he throws it, he goes down the steps, fetches a ball at a, a tube station. And, uh, you know, this is the exit, it could be in any city. So, suspension of time here and now, redundancy, which is common not only to the animal kingdom but also children because we can learn from children too oh, our master trainers when it comes to play i think it's appropriate to refer in this context uh, and in relation to you yesterday to think about the relationship between art architecture and play in the 2021 edition at the biennale of architecture the two-year exhibition of architecture how we will live together that uh, that had also a, a spin-off in Marghera, how we'll play together, not only because of the fun installations made by important international architects through which it was possible to explore climate, uh, children and adults, but also because of the many installations scattered between the arsenal and the gardens of the arsenal, and then uh, the milk of dreams that is is based on a work by uh, Anita Garrison and the Belgian pavilion that could be defined uh, as the pavilion of a nice play that uh, draws inspiration from this work by Peter Bruggen, Children Games. Now, in this painting, how many games are represented in your view? There are 200 people between adults and children. How many games are represented here? Just say any number, don't worry. How many? 80? All games. Excellent response. 72. And you have references. Why am I saying it, that it's a troop to Peter Bruegel? Because the curator of the pavilion, Francis Ellis, uh, the nature of the game, transforms the same pavilion in an immersive environment, a sort of uh, multi space, uh, um, uh, an open space. Uh, multiplex which uh, where we see games from all continents from the snail chase in Belgium from uh, mosquito hunting in Congo and a kite uh, the game of kites in Afghanistan which was a symbol of freedom and prohibited until a short while ago so this um, Carolyn of uh, human games is, has this as its common thread uh, children games through and we see it through them. She is Lucia Bertina, play coach and founder of Play Factor and co author of the Manifesto of Play, an experienced person, an expert in game and in playing in Italy. And she again refers to the two notions of play and ch uh, childhood. Now, I'd like you to focus on those two lines. Uh, um, so, during childhood, unconsciously, we have developed certain aptitudes that were useful regarding uh, planning, strategy, planning, decision taking, creativeness, and risk taking, and um, being resourceful. Another suggestion, let's try and fuel our creativeness, our imagination. Yesterday, Carlo Ratti, in a very enlightening and significant presentation, referred to the playground at MIT 
Mitchell Resnick teaches at MIT too, uh, who is a, an expert in uh, uh, teaching or educational technology. And he has uh, seen this creative spiral. And I'd like to focus on three elements that perhaps we're losing and we hope to recover them in uh, vocational training and lifelong learning and organizational settings organization game and sharing resnick hopes that we'll move from lifelong learning to life lifelong kindergarten so a kindergarten for life and yesterday somebody else came up with kindergarten and it was formalized by probable in in 1836 um, because a playground and not just metaphorically, to favor imagination and creativity and sharing and play. Resnick identifies four P's that should be included in any educational project, and not just educational projects, but a project. Resnick worked with Seymour Papert, to who uh, formalized the constructionist approach, so the creation of artifacts, uh, uh, together with other groups, uh, with peers, passion, peers. We've had some nice examples over the past two days, and the pupils of the Vocational Training School of Castelfazon and the coordinator was talking about this cooperation amongst peers. Mario Dallarico was referring to apprenticeship that could also be tied to cognitive apprenticeship strategies. You, an apprentice observes and supporting scaffolding and uh, last phase fading, he support is reduced so that that person can be put in a condition to operate independently and of course play. A last idea, let's contribute to making the boundary between play and work blurred. Uh, so often we use the expression out, out. Why not use work and play? Because the opposite of uh, play is not work, the opposite of play is depression. Play and work have in common creativeness to build new artifacts renew connections and often we hear even during training activities we hear about team building and team working so why don't we t start talking about team playing a team that plays within an organization as a team Handling with care, that uh, works well in Italian because the words handle, manageare, so also contains the words hands. And then uh, we have a carabinier. Why? Let's imagine an imaginative carabinier and to uh, climb up uh, the a mountain face and avoid falling down between pandemic, post-pandemic wars. And what a last reflection, a metaphorical one. In the background, we see the uh, song by Pearl Jam. Who recognizes this image? Into the Wild. It's the story of Christopher McCandless, a young boy who doesn't accept the professional pathway imposed by his family. After graduating, he escapes for three years. He calls himself Alex Supertrap. He wants to reach Alaska. He gets to Alaska when the weather is still good, spring, summer. But then the winter comes and the meat he had gotten rots and he is no longer going to buy and he has to eat. He can't leave Alaska and unfortunately he eats some poisonous berries and he dies. And he is found by his sister and in a notebook she finds happiness is real when shared. So with the obviously uh, do lightness of what real means or actual means, we can say that learning is real only when shared, so it's effective. 
and significant, motivating, pleasant, and ethically responsible. And we could open up a window on ethics, but this is not the place. Only when it's shared. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Good day. I'm not going to introduce myself because uh, Maria Fabiani already introduced me yesterday. We didn't know. We, I didn't know Mario Cusani. I didn't know me. But uh, things uh, then uh, uh, come down uh, to uh, uh, something that we share in common so and uh, we share uh, these words uh, play game is uh, what we are and i would like to start from uh, uh, this so what work culture do we have here we have uh, some examples uh, great resignation uh, you only live once, uh, quite quitting. So technology, artificial intelligence, that are always more present and are questioning the traditional cultural work. And uh, we feel uh, that we are disoriented we feel an urgency to respond to this uh, change in scenario. A research carried out by GAB in Italy says, uh, this was a research done last year, that only 4% has what they do. If uh, the culture changes, if we want to find the sense, the meaning, and reorient ourselves when we feel confused and disoriented. I'm not speaking of the world that is complex and uncertain because it's something we have all seen. But uh, also in terms of uh, uh, career management or life management, because we are speaking of a life project, we are a unicum. We are one single entity. We are not split into work and personality. And the example of expert uh, says it very clearly. So we should uh, shift uh, from a linear, stable training and career path over time. And uh, we should, uh, that was matching uh, people uh, attitude what the environment was asking we should shift to a more complex challenging process so that should accompany us uh, throughout our life uh, lifelong learning we will have lifelong career management as well so we have a paradigm shift this is what we need we have to imagine career management as uh, a preemptive action, uh, trying to anticipate uh, what might happen, uncertainties, desires, and therefore uh, no longer considering career management something that is done uh, as a last resort to. Um, try and cope with uh, some risks. We have to prevent risks, considering the great evolution currently underway. But the question is, uh, because humans, uh, so I hear about uh, changes, but the topic is not changing. Because if we look back to the past, because I'm a futurist, but being a futurist past is very important. We had a lot of changes. We have come up to the fifth industrial revolution, but also many other revolutions and changes. Changes always occur since mankind appeared on the earth. 
but changes now occur very rapidly at an unprecedented rate. A 360 uh, degree change, uh, economic, uh, social, etc. So the real question we should ask ourselves uh, is not how should we face a universe that seems to become more complex, but how to improve our ability to exploit the emergence uh, of uh, innovation, of novelties, which are not always so negative because we consider uh, what comes out of the emergence of innovation or, or new things as something negative. And let's come down to the real topic. Why should we speak about future? Or I can suggest a, a rather futures, plural. All the decisions we make are somehow looking at a certain future. When uh, we uh, make a decision, either personal or professional, we try to imagine the future we will have. The future is the place where changes occur, the only open and multiple space uh, to act. And uh, there is not only one future, but many possible futures. But uh, let's say that uh, we have uh, a skill that helps us. In fact, UNESCO, as a global laboratory of ideas and uh, cutting edge of human knowledge, has uh, um, uh, forged, forged a word, futures literate, or future literacy. And future literacy is uh, a type of literacy like writing and reading is a skill that enables us to better understand and comprehend the role of the future, what we see and do. Uh, knowing the future enables us to get ready to recover and invent as changes occur. So it's a, a skill that all individuals have and so that they're able to transform and uh, improve. Why future literacy is uh, a universal accessible skill? Because the future is not there, and there can only be imagined. And what is positive is that all human beings uh, have the ability to imagine. And this was brilliantly pre exposed uh, by the, the colleague who spoke before me. So the ability we have uh, without knowing it, and we no longer uh, are able to train it. Playing children, children paradoxically, are the futurists, the best futurists we have. I like to The only future strategy university uh, is uh, in uh, Trento. Professor Poli uh, has the chair, and uh, Scopia is a spin off uh, of the university that uh, is working with public uh, and private uh, universe, uh, um, entities and works at school with elementary children with incredible surprising results. Uh, another important aspect I would like to underline because of two reasons is the following. First, not only because uh, UNESCO is uh, rediscovering uh, this uh, essential skill to cope uh, with uh, skills, uh, uh, with the challenges of this uh, century and the coming century, but also the JRC has uh, um, looked at, at uh, skills. I would like to highlight it because we are in the European year of skills. We had a green digital tetracont uh, for enterprise uh, skills and recently Green Comp uh, that uh, wants to develop uh, green skills uh, that, uh, as uh, the representative of the European Commission said, are linked to, to 
green and environmental transition. And uh, there are 12 uh, skills uh, uh, into four cluster. One is the vision of future. That is to say the attention that the Commission is also um, placing on this. Uh, and uh, we have the skill concerning the awareness about our emotions. And this is something that has been highlighted by the previous speakers. And I uh, want to link uh, emotions with strategic uh, foresight skills because uh, highly sensitive people can really uh, give an, a great added value in terms uh, of imaginative skills and the ability to use uh, emotions, intuitions uh, to create a greater awareness uh, and construct an image uh, of a preferable future. We have to, drive, uh, to try to develop uh, the impact of uh, um, future literacy on human governance are just listed here. I would like to close uh, and uh, I will uh, give you the material if you like. But here we have innovation, discovery, leadership. Today we were saying that highly sensitive people uh, are considered not to be good leader, but I'm not so confident about it. Agility, uh, extra capability, uh, resilience. So uh, what type of skills should we develop and train? I underline one important aspect, uh, the ability to combine, so to uh, connect points, uh, to be multidisciplinary. So logic, call analysis and disciplined imagination are two important aspects. We are a unicum, we are a single unit entity and therefore we have to put all this together in order to It's a, a sort of literacy. It's like a reading and writing. Also being able to foresee the future and uh, uh, find uh, our way, our path to the future is liberating. It frees us uh, and uh, gives us a possibility to be active citizens. And this is socially useful in order to create a more inclusive society that can cope with the uh, complexity of the world around us. Uh, a brief insight about uh, the way in which we work. Uh, in the present, in, at present, we have uh, the forces of the past uh, and we are thinking about uh, forecast uh, in terms of future, so statistical analysis. Uh, forecast uh, trends and mega trends, uh, the uh, analyzing skills, analyzing the past in order to make forecast and projection. We have uh, the mm, pull of the future, push of the present, but we have to understand the pulling force of the future, <clears throat> how things are going to develop. Uh, and so there is a paradigm shift. Not as we are um, thinking, so past, present, and future, but past, future in order to go back to the present. How can we design the future? Here I borrowed uh, uh, this uh, strategic curation model by Oliver Ding that uh, implements uh, the paradigm of uh, uh, designing the future. We have the experience of the past, the decision. Uh, taken today, looking to the future, but then going back to today. How should we deal with surprises? Uh, we shouldn't uh, deny it. We live in a world of uncertainty. Another skill that has to be uh, further developed and trained is prospective thinking. 
That is to say, the mental attitude that looks at what will come with an open multidisciplinary approach. I was very pleased, and I had no doubt, of course, given the names of the authoritative speaker and colleagues who are much better prepared than me. Here, uh, in these two days, uh, the attitude was of multidisciplinarity and openness, because as Professor Roberto Poli says, working with the future doesn't mean, in fact, uh, predicting what will happen. Maria uh, asked me, how should I call you? Because uh, uh, in Italian, we say futuristi, but uh, futuristi uh, is like uh, witchcrafting. So uh, what is the future? What is happening tomorrow? This is something we cannot see. say. We cannot foresee the future because the world is uh, luckily very rich and surprising, but we can be open and ready uh, for sur surprises and prepare to uh, deal with them or embrace them. And this is very important. Uh, this skill is really very important uh, for future forecasting, the ability to anticipate, uh, <clears throat> because we can make any forecast, uh, any uh, study about the future. There are different methodologies that can be more or less interesting or intriguing. It depends on uh, the type of future futures that you're trying to foresee. <coughs> but if we do not use uh, the output of the study to take this, make decisions today, it's just a, a pure exercise. Uh, a theoretical exercise, uh, but uh, we are just, uh, uh, it's a sort of witchcraft and nothing more. So understanding the future to act in the present. Uh, future literacy is opening up new horizon. And uh, uh, this is a skill that we already own, we already have, we just have to train it. And to close, I would like to thank uh, the organizers. I would like to thank uh, the Metropolitan City of Cap uh, Roma Capitale, the University of Lublin, because uh, they gave me the opportunity not just to speak as Roberta, but to speak about future literacy in a very authoritative context of people who can really understand. And I hope that this uh, can help uh, future literacy and foresight to give uh, its contribution, especially in this moment, because I think that this skill is uh, badly needed to contribute as a uh, community and individual to a preferable world. Thank you. We have three minutes, but I'd like to make some considerations. You have already anticipated this. Uh, so namely, I'd like to say there always seems to be an apparent contradiction between the two positions, enhancing the here and now and working to build or imagine futures. And well, actually, you've already provided some indications about the profound connection, uh, but I'd like you to represent this from the, your two different perspectives because I think there's a difference and if there's time, I'd like to add my contribution. Thank you. Um. I have taken some notes, and if you will allow me, I'll read them out very slowly because the here and now, in particular, relegated to play, I would obviously focus on this in relation to the pair play and work. Uh, Alan Watts, an English philosopher, claimed that this is the true secret of life, being entirely absorbed in what you're doing here and now. And instead of calling it work, 
realizing that it's a game. This reference to the here and now made me think about an interview that Enzo Biagio, an Italian journalist, made to Osho in 1987. In the last question, which um, Biagio asked, he said, asked, what is your recipe for happiness? And he replies, every child is born happy. Every child is born innocent and wonderful. Watch a child collecting shells on the beach. He is happier than the richest man in the world. What is his secret? That secret is also mine. The child lives in the present moment, enjoys the sun, the salty air of the beach, the wonderful expanse of sand. He is here and now. And then he tells a short story about a great mystic who is dying. And his disciples ask him, Master, what is your last message? The master points to the roof of his hut. A squirrel was playing, so play. And all the disciples looked up and for a moment, oh, sorry, I got lost as the speaker. There was absolute silence. The master then said, this is the message of my whole life. Live in the moment. It is wonderful to listen to the squirrel playing on the roof without worrying about anything else. Okay, thank you. I've been left with a daunting task. Given the short time available, I too would like to close by referring to two thinkers, two people who can surely convey a deeper message than what I can do. Mahatma Gandhi, who says that the future depends on what we do in the present, so being here and now. And, and Nietzsche, who says that the future influences the present as much as the past does. Thank you. Well, my position, well, I did part of my training education in France and, and so and despite the fact is the fact that the most widely used term is strategic force, I like the term perspective in France because we can translate that with forecast in Italian. And that's where we get stuck. It's not foreseeing the future. And this has implications with regard to leadership too, because prospective in France, in French, sorry, means this foresight, which is different from forecast. So the forecast that you make on the quantitative and qualitative data of the past and present to inoculate but it adds the density of meaning which comes also from how you live the present moment. And so this dichotomy, the present influences the future, the future influences the past seems to a skateboard, anyway, to be real is real and different. And this is important in leadership because um, it's not enough to make a, a forecast of futures. You need to offer a future dense in mean, and this is what has been lost lately. And it's a difficulty that younger generations are facing. And the fact that there is aspect of imagine and uh, you said past, future, present. So imagination in relation to the action as in play, as we do when we move. I uh, like this particularly and, uh, and the latest neuroscientific research has shown that there is a strong correlation with creativity, motor imagery, so, so 
motor imagination is a very rich area, very dense, and it's very important in childhood games, which is something that we lose yesterday. The school we saw yesterday, where we work, we are forced to sit and be immobile in places as we're doing today because we can't move away from this culture. So uh, whilst you were talking, I apologize, and then we'll wrap up. I don't know whether you know King Lear by Shakespeare, the play by William Shakespeare. King Lear is this king who, if I'm not mistaken, the servant says this name that is authority. We're talking. Um, We've had internationally renowned experts who've talked. So, experts talk. He is an expert, an authority. But at the end of the tragedy, it's a tragedy. Everybody dies. Why? Because he's an authority, a leader, a king. But he was incapable of offering density of meaning of the future. Thank you. So here we are. So this uh, session will focus on uh, the details. That is to say, we're going to speak of highly sensitive people in the workplace. Uh, and we will understand a little bit more about we now. I'm sure about it. Uh, let's start uh, with uh, Laura De Cuniene advisor of uh, human resource director of uh, the Romero University in Lithuania. And I'm very interested because highly sensitive people are physically and emotionally tired because often they have to adapt to a workplace, which is not uh, so easy for them if we consider their personal traits. So let's learn something. Thank you. Okay, I, my first idea was to stand and to share with you, but I will do that. Oh. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Laura. I came from a very small country, Lithuania. And I want to present a little bit my university my alma mater and university where I came back after almost 16 years as HR, not only like a student. And as you see, we are not very big. We have only 6,000 students and about 6, 000, uh, 600 uh, staff members for faculties where we are working with social things, law, psychology, uh, management, and public security. What, how I came there, how I came back to university. Situation was so. We have external uh, environment, situation very tense for really. And there was quite difficult times for us as a university and for our management for really because it was like new rector, new management team. And what they understand that they can work with all difficulties externally. But then COVID comes and all internal emotional things in our stuff starts become more crucial and more difficult. And management team understand that they can't work with that only on themselves, that they need help from professionals. And I'm very glad that they did that decision and they decided that they need help because this decision for the managers usually is mostly difficult decision. To say that I can't do any, something and to decide to look for the help. The first step was looking for the professional. I'm lucky and happy that it was me. In another hand, 
my suggestions was to do employee opinion survey. Just manager situation sees in one hand. I, as professional, sees in another way. Our staff members have different opinion, and employees, when you are talking with academic staff, with students, they find all, you can find all ways of opinion what's happening in university and what we, situation we have there. And the second part was to share results of this survey, then make actions and made one more survey just to see what's happened and maybe some changes. When I present this for the management team, the first impression of my line manager was, Laura, you know, we are not running, we are running marathon. We are not sprint runners. And I was thinking, yeah, yeah, I am professional. I know how fast we can be, but life happens differently. We did opinion survey. I'm happy that there participate more than half of our staff members. Uh, a lot of academic staff, a lot of uh, administrative staff. You can see the results. We, I think we have all the same. Negativity, lack of leadership, onboarding, um, communication, information sharing. After COVID, everything was in this high level stress, even more than usually. But the most terrifying for me thing was when trade union director called to me by phone and said, who are you? Why are you asking those things? People calling to us, employees calling to us, where you will share this information. This is really a conf uh, confidence uh, and no one will know who will write something. I was shocked. I understand that sensibility and sensitivity of our com community is so high that we can't even imagine. We can't measure that you normally. But when people are afraid to share, it means that Fear is the highest emotion for the sensitivity. Was, it was crucial because all other results, we can imagine that it is. It's like re re realization that we see the same as our employees. But that fear to share was uh, something with what we have to work a lot. And what we did. In the first year, we did a lot of things. Uh, it was very hard year. Uh, in the beginning, we understand that if we see, if you know Maslow uh, motivation, this pyramid, the first two are safety and physiological. In organizations, safety and physiological things are processes, salary, and uh, transparency. And we worked a lot with that. We look through all uh, salary and benefits area, and we, need, we made new system. We share that with people a lot, with employee. I don't know even how much meetings I did and trainings with them. We share this opinion survey results with everyone. We collect feedback. We share uh, salary system new, and then. One more thing, what we did that year was performance evaluation. Those yearly meetings, because usually they don't have them. Previously, only some leaders was doing them in university. And we decided that it's crucial, important, because feed, about feedback, about information flow, we have very negative results. The beginning was very hard. After already second year, I can say that now trade unions not seeing that uh, performance evaluation is something bad. Now they are saying that those managers who are not doing that, with them we will talk. 
because our employees are saying that they are not doing. They want meetings, but they don't have it. And we train leaders. We walk through onboarding process about automatization and helping to understand and to do all those uh, legal things and infrastructure things easier to them. But you know, this is organiza organizational things. For really what works is 2F, fun and food. If you want to bring everyone in one place, you have to give them fun and food. Of course, food for free. It can be like free F, <laughs> food for free. But we do a lot of festivals, uh, sustainable event, uh, advent mornings, excursions. For really, what we find out that all new, modern, very fashionable motivation things is not working in our organization and in our com community. We even have comments that sports events, I'm too old to do sports. Can we have some creativity or some nice things? Hmm. We want to go to excursions together for free. Okay, for me it seems like you're crazy. But now we are going two times per year to excursion near somewhere in Lithuania. And one time per year we are doing canoeing. And you can imagine, it is not the same every time the same people or employees. All the time, it's like 20% the same, but other ones are changing. And for me, it was like so much, I can't understand. I came from big uh, corporations, big companies, and there is nothing like this. There is like fancy food, fancy things, onboarding bags, but there is not working things like this. There is working things what is about people but it's about our community, where average age is about 52. We understand that we need to work with them as they are, for really, what is important for them. And others, the main, how to say, important thing was, we start to talk with them. We don't send them to other cabinet, we not send them to other specialists. Now our cabinet is, if you want to work, you have to close the door by lock. Because all the time someone is coming and coming and coming because they, why they are doing that? Because they know that they will get answers. No matter what question is. Even if I don't know the answer, we will find the person who will have it. And for really can help. And now we have trust of organization and of community. And when we did the second year, we work, uh, as I said, in the first year we work a lot with uh, uh, appreciation and information. And you can see the results. In academic staff and administration, we grow up in those area for really where we did where we did not some, but quite big effort, it's a showing on the results. And we see that we are going to the right direction. Of course, it's not one year thing, it's not even two years thing. Cultural changes are for free for five years, especially in very long and old organizations. And we are still working. This is our university, we have infrastructural uh, uh, investment project, you can see we have very green and nice area and using them uh, we have hammocks and some swings in those uh, bushes and sitting places and working places where our community can come and to sit. Of course in the beginning it was like, hmm, really? Now they are just doing that. <laughs> and for really, we have still issues. One of them is how to bring academic stuff back. 
If you ask me, I don't know what we are doing. I have maybe to do some dances or some young girls or something. I don't know for really. But uh, we feel that we need these connections and we need to work together. And for them, it's too quite important. Even, it's e even if you think that easier to stay at home. For growing together, we are coming to be together. Um, improving employee experience and work, how they feel, what connections they have, what they can get, and not only do those official connections, but to have more unofficial connections, Co competence development plans and trainings. We talked already about competence for the future. HR always lives in the future, you know, one or two years ahead. But we are, and we are doing now for achieving something. But we have to know what we are achieving, where we are going. If no, it's not working at all. Um, simplification of processes, one of the hardest things. And one of the why people appreciate and feel loyal to the company when they know what is happening and what to expect. This is the main thing. If I know what to expect, even if I don't like result, but I know that for everyone the result will be the same. Um, advancement or we are working with employer branding and not working outside we are working inside the company in, in university because we have 200 ambassadors in administration and 400 ambassadors in academic stuff and we are working with them to show how we are changing how we are changing processes and what we are doing on the other hand, infrastructural consolidation, it sounds very strange, but for really, you can see, I can show you, I think I have, yeah, uh, I'm sitting there in second floor, uh, my colleague is sitting there in third floor uh, in my, of my team colleague, and other colleagues are sitting somewhere there in second floor. You can imagine that to meet my colleagues is not so easy. Other teams sitting the same, someone there, someone there, and we are running through all corridors and we are not meeting each other. I am running because I like to see people face by face, but usually we are not even calling, we are just writing emails each other. Even in the one team, we are not seeing each other for a long time. And after COVID, it's even stronger. For that reason, we decided that we will sit in this building, everyone. Not, you can't see this one more part, but we will be together to meet and to have connections. And development safe environment to share knowledge and opinions. We are working with that. And we can work with that only when we have real connection, real conversation, face by face. Sometimes team in the teams, but still, when you don't afraid to come and ask, and when you're not afraid to share your questions. Um, and the last one, yeah, it's, it's our last excursion from one week ago, Friday. Yeah, everyone is happy because we are just in beginning. After 15 kilometers, no one was so happy because we are walk, we have walking through the bushes and we have excursion and blah blah blah. But what I understand that we are all different. Every community, every organization are different, and HR is like architect. We are not building up buildings, we are not making a designs, but we are building cultures and building relationships and connections. Yeah, and I hope that 
you have inspired of our connections buildings because you can see everyone is happy and it's like the best present for me. Grazie. Aspetto. Thank you. I'll wait for you to put your headphone on again. So, a university with swings and with hammocks makes me want to register at university, go back to university again. Having hammocks is wonderful, and I thought that perhaps you could use uh, uh, scooters to meet up, uh, and this is in line with play and uh, fun. You have created uh, a space so where you can work uh, in a better way, in a more playful way. Now we're going to move from a container of people to people, so aside from the pandemic, both before and after. A highly sensitive person at work. The first contribution, they're both from the user daily counter. The first will, presentation will be by Manuel Fernandez Alcantara. Well, uh, first I want to thank uh, Maria Fabiani and La Città Metropolitana di Roma Capitale for the organization and also to the USA University. Okay. Um, in our last presentation, Laura talked about uh, the importance of uh, um, employers. Okay. And I'm going to focus a little bit on employers. Uh, in the um, first session of yesterday, Professor uh, Barilla spoke about how in the promotion project we have developed a series of focus group to try to see, for example, in that case, how uh, was the employer perception of people with uh, high sensitivity. Okay, so I'm going to focus a little bit on the results that we have made uh, with the Spanish population. Um, I'm not going to spend many time in the introduction section because I think that we have already known and we have already spoke about the concept of high sensitivity, okay? But uh, I think that it is important uh, to see how the trait, the personality trait of sensory processing sensitivity can appear in different spheres. And this is part of the result of uh, the emotion project when we made uh, a really interesting uh, systematic review. And this is important because our focus group and the qualitative research that we perform was based on these four main areas. So we want to see how uh, high sensitive people at work will have uh, um, by one side obstacles and by other side they will have positive uh, aspects in relation for example to the physical sphere, to their social sphere, to the emotional sphere and also regarding cognitive uh, aspect. Okay? So I'm not going to, to talk too much about uh, that. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. Uh, as uh, also Anka said in a previous presentation, the research regarding high, uh, highly sensitive person and work, they show like two uh, different aspects. By one side, for example, they say that they can be a person really useful for different kind of enterprise. But at the same time, it is true that we know, for example, that uh, the intensity of highly sensitive uh, may be associated, for example, to perceiving more stress and in some cases also to develop, for example, burnout. So what it is important is to understand exactly, for example, what may uh, happen or why some people with high sensitivity can really adapt to their enterprise and became a really good members of them and why some of them may find some kind of obstacle or difficulties. Uh, also, we know, for example, from, uh, from one of the chapters developed by Monica Varilla, that a high sensitive uh, person can be, for example, in the cognitive aspect, extremely attentive and innovative. Okay? Also, that they can make careful decisions, being really loyal and being 
conscious person working at the enterprise. Also, due to their deep of processing, they may focus on detail and be more aware of the long-term consequence. We have been spoken uh, this morning about anticipation, okay, which is also a, a central aspect. Also, people with high sensitivity may easily learn from their past experience. And finally, they can be very sensitive, for example, to uh, the boss expectation. What do our boss want uh, of us? And also, they can be easily uh, adapt uh, to different rules and uh, norms. So, um, uh, we ran um, a series of focus group, a qualitative research with the objective of trying to understand the employer's perception of people uh, with highly uh, sensitivity. So, uh, we uh, recruit a total of 20 participants, mainly women, and uh, that they came from three different uh, places. We have six participants who were primary educational teacher. We have 10 university teacher and also uh, researchers. And finally, uh, we obtained a total of six healthcare professionals, okay? all, all of them working in the province of Alicante in Spain. So we uh, perform the interviews uh, on an online, online way using the Google Meet platform. We uh, record them and then we make an initial analysis based on thematic analysis, okay, with the main idea of identifying the main codes and also trying to see which were the main themes in, uh, in common in all the, all the different focus groups. So in this slide, you can see a, a general resume of the, of the main results, and we are going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, each one of, uh, of them, okay? So initially, the first term that we extract uh, from the data was the characteristic and management of a high sensitivity person, okay? And it was really interesting to see, for example, which were the ideas and the stereotypes that employers has about this concept that is really an, a new concept uh, that not everyone knew about that. So in general, they spoke about uh, empathy, okay? So they, they perceived that, okay, highly sensitive people are people who have a lot of empathy, okay, during their work. And also, uh, they say, probably they will be people, and if I think in some example, people that may have difficulties, okay, to cope with uh, war-related stressors, okay? But also, and this is very interesting, they also spoke about, for example, the devotion and the sacrifice of the people with high sensitivity, okay? Also about the sense of responsibility and how it was important, the emotional reaction that they have to the uh, different task, okay? Uh, also, uh, as I told you, this high capacity for uh, empathizing was, for example, relayed when uh, employers found that there were some kind of trouble. Imagine, for example, a discussion, imagine a, an argument at work, okay? There were important situations uh, for them. And also, high sensitive people at work may be characterized by their trust and closeness, okay? And for, um, for employers, that was really important because that positively impact on the world-related satisfaction of other members of the enterprise or other members of the, uh, of the work. Uh, regarding motivation, okay, so how can uh, employers motivate people with highly sensitive uh, aspect? In general, they say that this was really important that their work on quality terms, okay? So they didn't ask for them in a rigid way, okay? So flexibility is really important when we have people with high sensitivity at work. Also, uh, it was really interesting, the use of positive instruction and also the use of praise, okay? So positive reinforcement was also really good for highly sensitive people. And especially if we have an innovative task a creative task, this may be the task that we 
can order to people with high uh, sensitivity. Uh, well, I, I didn't tell you about, but here you have like a direct quotation, okay, from this focus group that uh, reflects uh, the analysis that we had uh, that we had made. Also, for highly sensitive people at work, it was really, really important the relations that they established with other members of the enterprise, and this was also something positive or problematic. Positive, why? Because they have really a good ability, good skills to help others and to cooperate with others, okay? But at the same time, there may be situation, this kind of uh, problem, uh, argument, etc., that may feel them overwhelmed or feeling fear, okay? So this is something important that we have to take in, in mind when we are working with highly sensitive people. Okay. And also, they were really, um, employers perceived that high sensitive people were really motivated to promote a good atmosphere between all the people uh, working. Regarding physical condition, uh, our results were, uh, were really in line with previous research. So, uh, for example, it was important uh, in the ambience, in the place of war, that the, there weren't many kind of uh, distractions, also that the light the noise, and also the levels of temperature may be adapt, okay, adapt to them. And finally, regarding implication for management, uh, participants in our focus group emphasize the importance that uh, we don't use a directive style. Okay? So, in that case, it's, uh, it's much more useful, for example, to use a management style that fosters participation, consultation, on all, and also empathetic resources. For example, uh, we are working now a lot with empathetic leadership, okay, that probably it will be a really good way to uh, gestion it, all this uh, aspect in, uh, in an enterprise, okay? And also to try to adapt some of the tasks and function, and that's why initially we spoke about the importance of flexibility, okay, uh, in this case. Because if we have uh, all this information into consideration, probably uh, having uh, people with high sensitive, a trait of high sensitive at the enterprise will be something that will help us to grow in our enterprise and not be at all uh, a problem. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, we can see that uh, this research highlights the main characteristic of high sensitive people from the point of view of uh, employers, specifically in that case of teachers and also healthcare professionals, and that we know that some of the characteristics of the highly sensitive people really can be a valuable resource in their future uh, job. Okay? And also, we have to, to consider and to take in mind that uh, there may be some kind of difficulties. Uh, we have difficulties, each of one, even if we don't have that trait. Okay? So, uh, thank you very much, Grazie mille, per, for your attention. Bravissimo, anche sintetico. È uscito fuori eh, l'argomento tra i principali quando si parla di persone altamente sensibili che è l'empatia. Quando si tende a prendersi cura degli altri, magari ci si dimentica a volte di prendersi cura. Sometimes you forget to take care of yourself, especially if you care too much for others. And this might entail uh, burnout. We mentioned it also, the previous speaker spoke about highly sensitive people are more prone to burnout syndrome. This is something we're going to see with the next speaker, Borja Costa Lopez of the Alicante University. I, pro I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. Federica, for the presentation. And well, I would like also. Um, uh, to thank uh, the Città Metropolitana of, of um, Roma Capitale, uh, the organization of, the, of this event, and also our, friend, our colleagues and friends for, for Poland, for, for the coordination, and all the members uh, that have, particip have, have participated so far in this uh, event. Well, uh, moving on to uh, my presentation, I would like 
uh, to contextualize a little bit because some of the participants have talked about high sensitivity, highly sensitive people, etc. So I'm not going to be, I'm not going to go deeply in a deeply explanation because some of them did so well. But I think it's uh, important to highlight the relevance and the importance of doing research in uh, high sensitivity and uh, with highly sensitive people. And the thing is that everyone, um, everyone is sensitive, but we can find different levels of sensitivity. We can find low, medium, and also high sensitivity. Okay, and it, depend, it depends on the level of sensitivity, we can find like different kind of social and clinical implications, both positive and also negative ones, right? But the most important thing is that uh, around a 20 or 30 percent, as Monica Varela said yesterday, uh, 20 or 30 percent of the worldwide population is identified as highly sensitive. And that's why it's important to uh, carry out um, in researches and also investigations on high sensitivity. But uh, regarding my presentation, I'm going to talk about the relationship between the sensory percent sensitivity and the world-related quality of life. But I'm just going to give you main results of a quantitative pile of the study. My colleague Manuel uh, have talked about uh, the qualitative uh, part, so I'm going to move on the quantitative one. But I'm just going to I'm just going to to deal with a small sample that we recruited some months ago. Uh, and I'm going to give you just the main results, just to give you an idea uh, what's the relationship and the association between this threat and uh, the world-related quality of life, right? So, okay. Um, Moving on to the uh, uh, background, to the theoretical background, as we all know, sensory percent sensitivity is a, is a personality trait, but the important thing is that it has and it presents a multidimensional uh, structure, right? And most of uh, our uh, researchers have agreed so far that uh, there are different dimensions, but most of them have mentioned these three of them the low sensory threshold, the ease of excitation, and the steady sensitivity. So, what's low sensory threshold? A highly sensitive people, highly sensitive people uh, uh, usually present like an unpleasant uh, sensory arousal when they are trying to face like intense stimuli, like positive or, or negative ones. For example, a stimulus, um, like they are coming from the environment or even a stimulus that are inside us. So the instance stimuli could be like noises, could be like bright lights, but also thoughts and emotions. Also, ease of excitation, what does it mean? The ease of excitation uh, means you feel mentally overwhelmed by internal and also external stimuli. An aesthetic sensitivity means the awareness of and the openness to positive af aspects of one's surroundings, of one's uh, environments, for example, the workplace, right? So, um, some of our researchers and some of our investigations uh, have mentioned and have highlighted that the SPS increases or may increase the probability to uh, feel overwhelmed to external and internal aversive uh, stimuli. Highly sensitive people at workplaces uh, may indicate greater stress and high level levels of burnout, and also the relationship between SPS and workplace environments have been studied in health and clinical studies. That's what we know so far, right? So our aim, our objective of this cross-sectional study was to uh, find out, to identify this relationship, to study this relationship between the SPS and the burnout in a sample, in a small sample of Spanish uh, Spanish workers, right? As I've said before, we're going just to give you a main result of a small sample, right? We followed these four uh, steps. 
So first of all, we recruited around 40, uh, 40 workers, around 40 workers uh, who, who were around 40 uh, years old, and we administered two main uh, tools, psychological tools. The first one is the HSPS. Uh, for uh, identifying and for uh, detecting the high sensitivity aspects of uh, high sensitivity. Uh, it contains like 27 items and the Spanish version shows five dimensions which are sensitivity to overstimulation, low sensory threshold, aesthetic sensitivity, psychophysiological discrimination and harm avoidance. Okay, these are the five main dimensions that our Spanish version found. Right? So keep it in mind because we're going to talk about these later. So, and the other one that we used uh, was the Meslec uh, Burnout Inventory to identify and to detect the work stress aspects of our uh, Spanish workers. And it has the three dimensions, the emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and the personal accomplishment. So, oh my gosh, what happened? Okay, yeah. So we followed the, the, this um, this procedure after the approval of our committee, uh, ethics committee of the University of Alicante. We recruited the sample, and then uh, we gave them the questionnaires, and finally we analyzed the data that we got from them. But the most important thing from a from a presentation, the results. The interesting thing is that. Sensitivity to all the stimulation had a strong, the strongest relationship with emotional exhaustion, but aesthetic sensitivity had also a really strong relationship with personal accomplishment in this sample. So here we can see the bright and the dark side of high sensitivity, right? We also can find that uh, there's also uh, a weak, almost moderate relationship between psychophysiological discrimination and emotional dis uh, exhaustion and low sensory threshold, again, with emotional exhaustion, but also with personal accomplishment. So, then we have the harm avoidance that has also another relationship with personal accomplishment. So what can we say about that? We can say that this pilot study resolved with just a small sample. We found that SPS may have both a bright side but also a dark side. With high sensitivity can be both a vulnerability factor to burn out, but also we have dimensions that we have to keep in mind to work with and to reinforce that are related to protective factor and to increase the personal accomplishment with our workers. So that's my presentation, my brief presentation, and well, I'm here for any questions you have, and I hope that you enjoy it as I am. Okay, thank you. Dostoevsky in an impedo di Dostoevsky in uh, wrote that, that beauty will save the world in an um, an impetus of optimism. We have ended on the note of beauty other times and. Uh, aesthetic sensitivity. Can I ask you for some examples specifically, if you're not too tired? So what was, sorry? Examples of? La sensibilità estetica. Examples of aesthetic sensitivity. How can we be uh, saved? What does uh, salvation look like? Okay. Um, in the aesthetic sensitivity, you mean? Well, um, Okay, the aesthetic sensitivity is uh, mainly um, related to the emotional, the emotional dimension, the cognitive dimension. That's really hard to 
to explain because when we talk about sensory processing, we just uh, say uh, we just um, I mean we can just we are just focused on the physical one on the physical dimension. As uh, my colleague said, the sensory processing sensitivity put the 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 attention on the cognitive and also the emotional um, dimension of this threat. So, for example, um, emotional uh, emotional examples of or or examples regarding the the aesthetic sensitivity is, for example, uh, this hyper um, empathetic empathetic ability of these people that could help others for example to deal with difficult um, difficult situation at workplaces that could for example help others um, <clears throat> to develop um, pro-social actions or something like that so this is relate this is the relationship with aesthetic sensitivity and the workplaces and the highly sensitive workers so that that's it Grazie. Thank you. Very expansion. Now, I don't know whether there are any contributions from the audience. We have two other presentations. Yes, that's true. I hadn't taken note of them, but we do have them. So thank you. Even though I have one other question very briefly, if you can answer, because it's a question that you, all three of you can answer. So whether highly sensitive people, uh, people with a greater sensitivity than the average people, and so not just HSPs, have a benefit from working from home or because of relations or meeting with others, they really need to be uh, in a workplace with other people. So is it a benefit or not to work from home for HSPs? Maybe it depends, I don't know. Okay, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to answer this question because, uh, to my knowledge, and there's no evidence and there's no studies uh, related to uh, teleworking and and as SPS. I don't know if um, other members like Monica you have here heard about um, uh, tele teleworking and and SPS. But to my knowledge, uh, I think there's no evidence. Uh, um, and, and research and research uh, on tele and teleworking and, and highly sensitive people, but um, and that's just conclusions that I can give you um, according to the the research and in the investigations of of uh, of SPS. And the thing is that uh, we need uh, to be in connection with environment. And the environment is really important. As we, ha as we have said before, um, it is important for highly sensitive people closeness, uh, for example, the use of positive instructions, working in group, cooperation, that could increase the motivation and also could be more beneficial. Um, but as I have said before, there's no evidence of it, of teleworking and SPS. But what I can what I can say is that if you have positive instruction for your managers, if you have, uh, for example, uh, if you get that closeness, even if you are working from home with your group, with your partners, with your workers, maybe you can be as efficient as you are at the workplaces. Thank you. I'd be spend hours working. Oh yes, very briefly. Yes, of course. I don't participate in any scientific things, but I can share only ex my experience from life, and I can say that for the very sensitive people, it's very important to have real connections. It's very important to meet people, to see them emotions. But on another hand, it's very important to have this very flexible and understanding managers who, if they feel uncomfortable, if they feel stressful, if there's any for really situation what can make them more sensitive to let them go home 
to work there and to make a possibility to feel comfortable in the place, in the workplace. Not uh, working from home. It's not uh, the, how to say, not a decision and not like something incredibly good and fun. Working from home is just the safe place to stay, but we have to work that this safe place have to be in the workplace, not only at home. Grazie. Thank you. Okay, then. We can then ask the, the other two speakers. I will avoid pronouncing their names to, to avoid offending uh, them because they're very difficult. I've just said uh, Lovisa, Ulfar Sotir, I'll try. And Leon Kinstar, who talked previously. Hello. Um, can you put on the first uh, the slide? So uh, hi. Uh, thank you for having us here, and thank you uh, to uh, to uh, VSA and Sita de Metropolitana del Roma Capitale for arranging this. I'm struggling with pronunciation myself. So we are here from Prios uh, Kompetanse uh, and from, uh, from Norway. I am uh, Lovisa Ulforsdottir. I am the department manager for uh, the software development department uh, in Prios Kompetanse. Uh, I will be here presenting uh, the platform, the digital platform called uh, the Sensitive Career Management Resources uh, platform uh, that we are developing in the promotion project. And with me, I have uh, one of Norway's uh, leading uh, practitioners. She is a mentor and life coach helping uh, uh, highly sensitive people managing their careers and highly sensitive leaders all over Norway. Uh, and we have, uh, due to, uh, we have a very short time. I'm going to do my uh, platform presentation very quickly, just showing the status of the development and, and uh, explaining what's going to be in the platform. And then we have decided um, to uh, do a little uh, fun twist on uh, Leanne's presentation. So she is going to do her presentation from within the platform, from online. So we can, uh, yeah, so here is, uh, we're doing mobile first. That's a rule in software development. So this is the first page, uh, front page of the platform after you've logged in. Uh, this is a resource center which will contain all of the materials, all of the outputs that will be developed in the promotion project that are meant to support uh, managers, career counselors, HR specialists in working with highly sensitive people, managing their careers or work lives. So it will have uh, various uh, uh, resources such as uh, uh, the highly sensitive uh, test, we will have guidebooks that will be developed and uh, various topics developed by uh, uh, partners in the projects. I'm just going to show you a little bit of uh, the functionality and what uh, our uh, uh, Polish, Polish University has developed. Uh, so there is uh, an introductory text to uh, a practical exercise where uh, the people using the platform can uh, write from their own perspectives uh, with their strengths uh, resulting from high sensitivity from a survival point of view and their weaknesses uh, from their own perspective so making their own type of mapping but i'm not going to uh, go too thoroughly through all of this this is the where we are at in the development we will be putting as we go on now con closing in on, on closing the project put in the resources connecting it with the database 
But now I, I would, would like to uh, allow Liam to uh, do her presentation. Uh, she will be talking about uh, mentoring and coaching highly sensitive people uh, as a practitioner. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, my introduction will be about highly sensitive employees and that they are available assets to all uh, kind of company. And uh, it will, I will do some tips on managing and mentoring highly sensitive employee. And this will be relevant, relevant for all manager professionals uh, working in collaboration. And my key word here in this presentation is coaching, mentoring, and highly sensitive employee. Uh, it's very important as a coach, mentor, or a manager, or an other ones working with uh, highly sensitive employees to understand highly sensitive traits. And I think most of you know a lot about this, and uh, uh, so I don't need to have to talk much about it, but it's important to understand. And also, to know about all the positive aspects around highly sensitivity and the challenge in a professional context, foundation for coaching and mentoring, and how the deep uh, information is processing for highly sensitive people, and that they are sensitive to subtle changes and cues easily overstimulated, and that has been talking about in the other presentations in different, uh, both today and some uh, yesterday. And they have a high of empathy, they feel a lot, and also for the other employees. They are open-minded and are understanding as essential. Empowering sensitive employees. It's uh, very uh, important to recognize the basic value, engaging self-esteem, strategies and uh, for supporting work environment, and also valuing sensitive and understanding how sensitive uh, employees can be an asset. The challenges for highly sensitive person at work, it has been talked uh, a bit earlier on, but i just take a quick one. And that's the negative environment, noise at the workplace, light and temperature uh, are sensitivity to, meaningless tasks. They need to feel that is something important they are doing, nothing just get some task and they just have to do it. Lack of independence, feeling overwhelmed, criticism, and stress. And the challenge for a high, highly sensitive employees is boundaries. That's one of them. And that's setting boundaries. It's easy, in a way, to say no, but for highly sensitive employees, it can be very difficult and also the feelings around, uh, should I say na no, actually I should do it, and the feelings and the, they think it's very hard. Uh, may, many highly sensitive employees struggle with these boundaries, and that's quite typical. As a coach and mentor, I've been helping a lot of people with this. Uh, and that's, uh, I think my, many of you also know about this, and that coaching and mentoring can be a good thing. Highly sensitive person who thrive in the workplace. They are professionally skilled. They used to see the whole picture. And they are genuinely interesting in their work. They unleash uh, creativity. They are good decision makers. And they are detailed, orientated, and analytic. They have a strong sense of responsibility and they are quick to identify patterns and good finding solutions. 
and they're also empathic and fair, they are not ego-minded and want to do it just for me, but they're always or nearly always thinking of the group or the team, how can we do it best together? And they are good at thinking outside the box, not follow the ordinary that they should use to. How to be a good coach or mentor? Uh, have a, a, as coaching uh, is an collaborative consideration, highly sensitive individuals, individuals pick up subtle cues, focus on opportunities and solutions, and avoid being preoccupied with problems and respect their uniqueness. As a mentor, share your experience and knowledge, act as an advisor, and for both, or actually manager or coach, mentor and manager, be empathy and clean in your communication, and also understand the highly sensitivity and the dust, uh, the depth of processing, overstimulation, emotional reaction activity and sensing the subtle. And what are the best tools for coaching? That's coaching questions about the job, different tasks, colleagues and the environment. And also focus on the strength and improvement and encourage on self-awareness and self-reflective thinking. How to support highly sensitive employees, address the environmental challenges, empower them to set boundaries, offer a flexibility and breaks, and that was talking about uh, working from home. All the people are different, highly sensitive persons, employees are different, and if they got more flexibility, they will gain more and the company will also gain more. Use the employee's trust and values model, understand their individuality, and also allow them to time to processing the information they got. They need some more time, a lot of them, and let give them this time. Provide constructive feedback and help them to manage overstimulation. Help them to stop before they are getting overstimulated. For some years ago, Emily called me and wanted coaching. She was nearly crying. She had worked in this, uh, it's a really Norwegian big company for more than a year. And this was her dream job. She really wanted this. But after it more than one year, she just felt overstimulated, not respected, and that this was too hard for her. And she thought she maybe wouldn't make it at all, and she was going to quit. Uh, during the coaching, uh, we had both, I asked questions, we talked about the job, and also different exercises. And then uh, we understand that she was highly sensitive, and she didn't know anything about that, so she had to learn a bit about it and learn how to, that she could be and behave in her job to be uh, the best for herself and for the company. And also an important thing for her was to set boundaries. Both the other people, the other employees in the team, they used to say, yeah, but you can do it. You are so good at this. And the boss said, I can always trust you. You are so responsible. And she used to say yes to nearly everything, but it's too much for her. So I had to help her with her boundaries. And after a while, she had a positive changes and she enjoyed being at this work. And about one year later, she called me and she was really happy because she was announced to the employee of the year in that company. So she had really made 
how she could do the best of herself until uh, to be in this uh, position. Tips for managing highly sensitive employees. Create a thriving environment and help them to set boundaries. Offer flexibility, and that's really important. Then you got more. Provide quiet time and fresh and value-based approach that the manager accept and uh, respect their time and that they will do the work very well. Assist them with planning when they need assistance. And also as a manager, it's important to see and understand where your employees are. Respect their individuality and also allow time to absorb the information and what's happening around. Deliver constructive criticism and support in overstimulated uh, situations. The conclusion of this presentation is that highly uh, sensitive employees can be wallaby uh, assets and with effective coaching and mentoring they can unlock their potential understand and support the unique traits and create the positive and accommodating work and work environment. Thank you. Bellissimo questo intervento, grazie. A wonderful presentation and, and uh, also excellent uh, organization work. So let's conclude. So let's thank uh, Città Metropolitana di Roma Capitale and Maria Fabiana. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible with her, so thank you uh, for having said all the way to end all this stuff, all the technical staff and all those who worked uh, to uh, organize this event. And I'd like to thank the interpreters as well. And please hand back your headphones. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. No. Yes, we have a contribution. Unfortunately, we'll have a light lunch that will be served from our use of the training. So I would like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank Mr. Carta who has stayed until the very end, a manager who stays to end to listen. And I'd like to thank the HR experts of AMA who stayed until then, because this already is a sign of a difference of the management style that they have. So thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions, but you have lunch. And you can do networking during lunch, and you can get all the answers and ask all the questions you like, and also and enjoy your time. Thank you.